Okay, today is November the 22nd, 2022. And we'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer. And during that time, we have the opportunity to name privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can be here as a royal family of God in obedience to your word, that we can learn and grow and look forward to the phenomenal things that you have in store for us in the future. We're living in the here and now, and it's not as easy as it was before. It never was easy, but now it's worse. These things are allowed by you, and they help us to build character. Helps us to take the doctrines that we have learned and apply them to our circumstances. And we pray that you will help us to have an open mind and really focus, because the book of Romans is, well, it's just sometimes difficult, but it's worth the reward when we really bear down and we focus and concentrate and we can see the mighty truths that few people see. It's not that we're any smarter than they are or better than they are. It's just that we have that spudazzo, that zeal, that wanting to know more and more. And you can continue to just teach us and we can't wait till we see you face to face. In the meantime, we're going to keep, keep on percolating. We're going to keep on taking in your word and see your faithfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> if you'll take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 24. Here it is on the board. Now, I know we've already been over this verse, verse 24. But I have a habit sometimes to go back maybe four or five or six verses and build again from that. And I've added some things that I didn't have before. And that's one reason when we put the notes on the website that we just don't add the ones that are current. <clears throat> the whole Romans series is on the notes on the website. And when I make changes like this, it means those are included as well. So in Romans 8, 24, it says, For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he, for what he sees. Nobody hopes for something that they already have. Now one of the things that I changed is I took Romans 8.25, which was connected to Romans 8.24 here, <coughs> excuse me, and, and deleted it, and now we're, ha we're handling it as its own, as its own uh, verse. It makes it easier, even though these two are associated with one another, it makes it easy to understand. So the first thing I have here is probably one of the most important notes to understand this, this scripture. <clears throat> the first line in verse 24 is not referring to eternal salvation, because that is based on faith and not hope. A lot of people see the word saved and it means one thing to them every time. It's talking about eternal salvation and <clears throat> most of the time in the New Testament it does not mean that. It means deliverance of some sort. A lot of times it might be the deliverance of your life, saving your life and so forth. 
but substantiate that it is not hope that saves us, but faith. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with him because we are justified before God and we're justified by our faith. When someone asks me, are you saved? I said, yes. <clears throat> this, was, of course, is talking about eternal salvation. And they say, how do you know? I said, because the Bible says if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, then we are saved from the lake of fire. And that comes by faith and only by faith. It is a gift. That's simple. Easy to understand. But you would be surprised at how hard-pressed people who have professed being Christians and have gone to churches nearly every day that they're open. And if you ask them, are you saved? And they say yes. And you say, how do you know? They're in the quandary. They don't know what to say. But it's simple. It's easy. Now, if the Bible is not true and a person is not saved by faith alone in Christ alone, then we put our chips on the wrong bet, didn't we? But we didn't. It is the Word of God and the promises of God and His promises is if you put your faith alone in Jesus Christ, at that point you are born again. And you are eternally saved. Now, hope has a part to play. But I wanted to nip this in the bud right from the beginning for people to know that's not talking about eternal salvation. <clears throat> Every time I think about <clears throat> nipping something in the bud, I think about Barney Fye. Nip it in the bud, nip it. That's the way he would say it. So hopefully that's been nipped. Here is a quote from the Bible Knowledge Commentary. Quote, God has promised that a believer's body will finally be delivered from sin and its effects by the work of his son. Now, he's talking about deliverance from the mortal body we have and the effects that it has on us. Those who respond by faith to that promise have hope. A confident expectation of that bodily redemption is, is in Genesis 5 5. Excuse me, Galatians. Uh, then we have this is the final step of salvation, and it was in that anticipation that we are saved. Now, let me explain for sure that you understand what he's talking about. He says the final step of salvation. Salvation is not a process and you are saved in the blinking of an eye. Whenever you are persuaded that the gospel is true and you believe it at that point, you are born again, you are a child of God. A host of things happen to you in your spiritually. But you are saved there then as you ever will be. But one of the things you have is eternal life. And you have it. It's imputed to you the moment that you are born again. But you don't need it right now, do you? I mean, we have it. But we also have a, what? Physical body. And so we're living on earth, on the planet, and our bodies are conducive to being able to live on, on this planet. But it's not good enough to live in heaven. And so whenever Jesus Christ returns and we have that resurrection body, our bodies are going to be changed. That is when that hope is going to be realized. And he says it's the last step. In other words, We are 
legally saved. We are legally God's children. Then we're going to be face to face. And it's at that point when eternal life kicks in. Because when this body is gone, you have to have something in order to be able to be with Christ and go where he goes, and he's going to heaven, he's going to other places, but these bodies won't cut it. <clears throat> but when you think of it, that is the hope that we are going to get a resurrection body. Now, I connected the dots for you. you I know you can figure it out anyway. People can say, okay, we're going to get a resurrection body. <clears throat> When is that going to happen? Well, we know enough eschatology that when Jesus Christ returns at the second advent, that that's when we get our resurrection body. First Thessalonians chapter 4 goes into great detail about what happens at that point. So I want to make sure, I want to make sure everyone understands that this is about having hope. Let me go to the scripture again. <clears throat> For in hope we have been saved, we have been delivered. And I'll show you in a moment what that's talking about. But hope that is seen is not hope. So we don't hope for something that we have. If we had the resurrection body, if we had it now, why would we hope to get it? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. I'm sorry, I meant to say the uh, the rapture. I'm glad I'm glad you're correcting me on that because it shows that you're awake. <laughs> yeah, and I like for you to do that because there are people maybe live streaming and they don't know the difference. And I know y'all know the difference, but if you tell me that I misspoke, then that will correct the situation. <clears throat> now I know this is last uh, Thursday's class, but we're going to touch on a few things on it. To substantiate what we just said, Galatians 5.5 5 says, For we through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Now, I know that you know that we already have God's own righteousness. And we want to be experiential, experientially sanctified which has something to do with righteousness as well. But in this particular case, the word righteousness, the Greek word here is dikaiosune, D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E, means more than righteousness. It means to be a, a mature believer. If you're a b mature believer, then you are to at least an extent experientially sanctified and righteous. For in hope we have been saved, that's what we saw from the beginning. What are we hoping for? That's the question that needs to be answered, and that would be a resurrection body. What are we saved from? The answer there would be a mortal body infected with a sin nature that gets sick, injured, and will, which eventually dies. Who could say that they have a perfect body, they never had aches and pains, never got sick, and you can hardly tell that they age? How many people can say that? I don't know if anybody can. These are wonderful bodies. But if we're going to be saved by them, and by the way, the older we get, the more, the harder it is to live in these bodies, isn't it? Yeah. So that's what the hope is. As our bodies wear out and they get weaker <coughs> and sicker, then we have a hope that even with the great things that they do in medicine today, they can only do so much. And so we're hoping for that resurrection body that won't have any of this. 
It'll be fit for heaven. Romans 8, 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who indwells in you. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit was a down payment of the great things that are going to happen yet future. And this is one of the great things, is that through His Spirit, we are going to have life they're going to add life to our mortal bodies, which means our mar what's going to happen to our mortal bodies? Let's say we're alive when Christ comes back. They'll be instantly transformed into this resurrection body. Now, if we don't last that long, if we die before Christ returns, then we still are going to have life to our mortal bodies is just a way of saying that the, the, the dead body that maybe had been died uh, dead for decades is instantly going to rise out of the grave with a perfect body that will last forever and will never die, will never age, you'll never have any sickness and so forth. Second Corinthians five four for indeed while we are in this tent, this body, we groan, being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed in order that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, this is not for those who have died and are in the tomb, uh, in the grave already. This is for those who are still alive and the mortal body will be swallowed up. In a blinking of an eye, you're going to have that resurrection body, which is forever. It says, but hope that is not seen is not hope for why does one also hope for what he sees? So if you see something, why would you want, why would you hope for it? It just doesn't make sense. The redemption of our bodies, which means obtaining our resurrection body, obviously has not yet occurred, so we hope for it. We don't hope for things we already have. Is that all making sense to you? <clears throat> Excuse me. J. Vernon McGee says this. You see, faith, hope, and love are the vital parts of a believer's life. There would be no hope if all were realized. In other words, if we are already at that point where we have a resurrection body and we're with Christ, then we wouldn't need hope anymore. Someday hope will pass away in realization. In fact, both faith and hope will pass away in the glory which shall be revealed in us. Only love abides. Y'all understand that, right? Good. Second Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but we look at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so I ask the question, how can someone look at things that are not seen? That's what it says right up here. Right here. I just added the we look because it was uh, understood that that's what it's talking about. But we look at things which are unseen, are not seen. And how do we see the, non, the unseen? Well, Hebrews 11.1 1 talks about faith. This is a very prominent scripture. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. For the conviction or evidence of things not seen. Now this, I tried to firm this up and explain it the best I could in this next paragraph. We hope for things that we desire. Isn't that true? And we hope for things all the time. I mean, it's just, if you've been out and you're been cutting the grass and you're dirty and sweaty and <laughs> you're getting older and it gets harder every time. And some, you, you heard a rumor that uh, some young man is going to offer to cut your grass for nearly nothing. Well, you would be hoping for that, would you? I mean, there's a million types of hope like that. But you hope for things that you desire. So here's an example. When we hear in the gospel that we can be eternally saved by believing in Christ, 
We hope that is true, wouldn't you? We were at that point. When you heard that for the first time, in your mind you were probably thinking maybe two things, but at least one. If that's true, what am I doing walk, running around trying to be good enough to get into heaven? And some people would think, oh, that's too easy. That's too simplistic. But we hope that it is true. Now, when we are persuaded it's true, and then I, if somebody might give you the gospel, and you say, uh-huh, okay, yeah, uh-huh, go away. And the next day, the next week, the next year, you don't know when it's going to be, but something triggers that. You can't get it out of your mind, and you start running it over in your mind again and again. And finally, bing, the light goes on, and you look, and lo and behold, you have been persuaded that it is true. Bam! That's when you're saved, right there. So, we are persuaded it's true. That is the point of faith which ensures salvation. That's what faith is. Is to be persuaded that the gospel is true. And at that point, and when I'm, I'm talking about an instant, you're saved because God takes that little blip of faith that you have. You realize that you truly believe in Jesus Christ. And he makes it to where it applies to eternal life, God's own righteousness, and about 40 other things to go along with. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is not applicable to what is seen. Something that already exists can be analyzed. If you can analyze something, you can touch it, you see it, and all this, it's not faith. But if somebody described it to you and you haven't seen it yet, that's when it's faith. So, faith is not applicable to what is seen. Something that already exists can be analyzed. But, faith regards that which is not seen. Something that has already happened in the past or something yet in the future. And so when somebody tells you such and such, such happened in the past. Well, you weren't there. Maybe the person that's telling you wasn't there either, but he said, this happened in the past. Well, that's where faith comes in. Either you're going to be persuaded that it did, or you're not. It's the same thing in the future. They say, well, there's a lot of eschatology. This, uh, I mean, the future things. And all of us have hope that is an confident expectation that Jesus Christ is going to return to earth and when he does, we're going to get a resurrection body and so will we always be with the Lord. We can't see it. But it's more real than what we can see. That's what faith is. And that's how we see things that do not exist. One of the differences that should be obvious between believers and unbelievers is believers live their lives based on the word of God, while unbelievers live their lives based on empiricism and emotions. <clears throat> this is one of the things I added I thought would go here. Empiricism is depending upon your five senses and your experience. Wouldn't you agree that this is, is a true statement? And I want you to, one word I wanted to point out, you might have missed. One of the differences that should be obvious between believers and unbelievers. And that is their lives are based on the Word of God. Unfortunately, most believers, you can't distinguish them between unbelievers by their behavior because they're saved, but they're hellion. They live a life like an unbeliever. But it should be obvious when a believer, but the difference between believers and unbelievers is the believer's lives are based on the Word of God. If I ask you that question and you had to tell the truth, would you say yes? I believe you would. I would. I believe all people that have doctrine, they're going to say, yes, that's, I live my life on what the Bible says. Well, it's a print on paper. Why do we 
put so much stock in living our lives according to the word of God. Well, we hope that it's true and the things that it says is going to happen in the future is going to happen. But more important than that, we put our faith in that. We believe it. We have the ability to believe that that is true. And unfortunately, if you ask most people, if you ask most believers, like I said earlier, uh, how do you know you're saved? They'll be quick to tell you, yes, I'm saved. There's no doubt about it. And you ask, how do you know? Unfortunately, about 90% of the time, they start talking about how good they are. And I've done this and I've done that. Which, to me, throws question whether they're really even saved or not. But it's hard to tell. It's probably nearly impossible to tell because it's very well, they might be saved, but they were never trained as to how you can have true assurance, and the assurance is in the Word of God. And so unbelievers pretty much live their life based on empiricism, things that they can see, that they can touch, and so forth, and emotions. But we're not that far from them. We live. We make decisions and live by our emotions sometimes, don't we? Hopefully we recognize it and nip it in the bud. Verse 25. <clears throat> this whole part here I added. See, it's a new verse. I didn't, I didn't have it connected to verse 24 like I had it before. But if we hope for what we do not see with per, per, uh, perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. When what, is the, what is the it? What are we waiting for eagerly? And that would be our resurrection body. <clears throat> and I, I don't know, I just decided I'm going to try to set this up to explain to you because you hear me say it all the time about the if conditional clauses and I thought I would just run through it real quick here. <clears throat> See the word if if there is red? In English, the word if sets up a, con a condition where the outcome is an unknown. For instance, if, maybe it will happen or maybe it won't. That's the way we use if in English. It's the only way to use it. <clears throat> However, in Greek, it sets up a, the if sets up a condition where there are four outcomes. Known outcomes. And so, I have the four outcomes here. The first class condition means it's true. Now, this is true from the speaker's standpoint. Sometimes in the Bible, it doesn't happen too often, but sometimes somebody will say something and it will be in the first class conditional clause and you know it's not true. So, the first class conditional clause means from the person who is speaking, from his perspective, it is true. <clears throat> Second class condition is it's not true. Third class condition is it might be true or it might not. That's the English if. That third class condition operates the same as it does in English. And then the fourth class condition is I wish it, I wish it's true, wish it is true, but it's not. That's the four conditional clauses. Now I'm going to apply that to what we have here. <clears throat> if we have hope, that sets up a conditional clause. Let's look at it in the verse itself. But is a contrasted conjunction, which means usually but. It's contrast with what's come before. <clears throat> if we have hope, that right there is what we're looking at. If we have hope is a conditional call, clause called the protasis. P-R-O-T-A-S-I-S. You can look it up in a dictionary and it'll say that's what it is. It indicates which conditional clause is used. Here it is a first class conditional clause. <clears throat> so that part, it's the same thing in English as well. When you have if something happens, that's the condition. If this takes place, then what is going to follow? So, and then, <clears throat> so here we have 
if is a first class conditional clause and it's a present active indicative. So what that means is if and it's true and it's ongoing present tense active voice the one who is speaking it is the one who produces the action and this is very important the indicative mood means it's reality. <clears throat> I, I'll just say this you don't need to know it but I just you might be wondering about that about this. <laughs> the word if <clears throat> in the Greek the, the word is actually we we pronounce it A, but it's E I. And that's means that's a first class condition of clause plus uh what you see here as an indicative mood if you have that EI, which is pronounced A, for if, it has to be in the, the outcome of it, uh, which is the apotesis, I'll show you in a moment, <coughs> has to be in the indicative mood. And that's how I can tell what it is. So, if we, ha if we have hope, that's the apotesis, sets up the condition. Now we have, with perseverance, we wait. Eagerly for it. Now, we wait is what is called the apotesis. Here it is right here. We wait is the consequent or the outcome of a conditional statement. It is called the apotesis, A-P-O-D-O-S-I-S. So you have two parts. Whenever you have the word if, and you see ifs all over the place in a, a Bible, whatever book it is. <coughs> so the first part says, if this is taking place, if, if, if we have hope, then what's the outcome of that? And we have, we wait. If you have, well, if you have hope, then we wait, and that's the apotheosis. What do we wait? What does it mean we wait? Well, it means that if it's the first class conditional clause, which it is, and if you hope, then you're going to wait. What's going to happen? What if, what if that wasn't an indicative mood and it was not true? Then it wouldn't be an indicative mood. It would be something else. So if it was not true, it would be if we have hope for what we do not see, we don't wait. That would be the the consequence. Well, I'm getting too deep. I need to move on. Anyway, I, I'm I'm looking at y'all. Uh, uh, is this resonating? I know some people love this. Oh, they like to get into the nuts and bolts. But I'm not going to linger. We'll press on. Um, we have one word that was in between here. See this? If we hope for what we... This part here is a, a prepositional clause. Uh, for what we do not see. That just adds more information to if we hope. And when we wait, it says we eagerly wait for it. That is another prepositional phrase that just gives you more information about it. But what I left out, because I didn't want to go into it when I was talking about this if conditions, is with perseverance. So here we have it now. If perse it, with perseverance. The Greek word there is hupomone, H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E. It's a noun, genitive, singular, feminine. And it means the capacity to hold out or bear up in the face of difficulty. It means patience, endurance, fortitude, steadfastness, and perseverance. Is it important? You better know it is. If you are a believer who hopes means you have confident expectation in the promises of God, you will absolutely need to have perseverance. You are part of a very small minority that will be attacked by the masses that will try to get you to question your faith. Have you ever experienced that? They're trying to tell oh no, you just can't believe. You've got to be baptized, you've got to be a good person, you've got to go to church, blah, blah, blah. Huh? Yeah, I do that sometimes. <clears throat> if you just say since, since you are, you have faith, 
in the English, that means, okay, you have it. It's true. Not only are atheists agnostics, cults, religions, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and so forth, uh, but also a large number of Christian denominations will try to get you to doubt your faith. People who are patient and have perseverance usually are more kind to others than those who lack such qualities. Would you agree with that? People who are patient and have perseverance. You can persevere with someone. You know, it, if you have a friend or it's a family member, anytime two humans get together, there's going to have to be toleration. We call it unconditional love or impers uh, 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 impersonal love. And the more that you can pers persevere, the more you can be patient with people, the more kind of a person you are. And I set this up and did that for this, what I have this little poem here. It says, a little kinder. Here it is. Let me be a little kinder. Let me be a little blinder to the faults of those about me. Let me praise a little more. Let me be, when I am weary, just a little bit more cheery. Let me serve a little better those that I am striving for. Let me be a little meeker with the brother that is weaker. Let me think more of my neighbor and less, a little less of me. Let me be a little sweeter, make my life a bit completer. I think you just made a word, a, a word there. <laughs> Keep me faithful to my duty. And I think I lost the line there. I don't know what happened. Let me be a little braver when the temptation bids me waver. Let me strive a little harder to be all that I should be. Let me toil without complaining. Not a humble task disdaining. Let me face the summons calmly when death beckons me away. And that was from Anonymous. That'd make a good song, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, I don't think it was this deal, but you're right with the name of it. And uh, something else here. Two Christians were driving through an area where the road was being widened. And at the end of the repair zone, a sign informed travelers, quote, construction ended. Thank you for your patience. I think that would make an appropriate epitaph for my life, said one of the Christians. Construction ended. Thank you for your patience. That's pretty good. Okay. Hope expects God's promises to be fulfilled, or is not hell, uh, of hope. <clears throat> hope expects God's promises to be fulfilled in the future as surely as faith enjoys his present blessing. Hope is something yet to happen. You understand that? That's why when it happens, you don't need the faith, I mean the hope anymore. But faith can enjoy things that are present now. You have faith that something would happen. You pray. And you ask the Lord to do whatever he's going to do. And he does it. That is blessed. This is a quote from the biblical illustrator, Romans, uh, in uh, volume two. He says, hope, in fact, is the great mover of human mind. The hope of doing good is the inspiration of our noblest deeds. You understand that? Hope is, inspires you to do great things. You're not a naysayer. You have confident expectation that what you are hoping for will come to fruition and you are willing to make it happen to the best of your ability. The hope of subduing our evils 
and of being transformed into the image of Christ incites us to struggle <coughs> excuse me, against it. And a lot of people, unfortunately, we, uh, let me say this, we all have our area of weakness. And sometimes there'll be believers and their area of weakness has just taken over their life. And unfortunately, because they, they, they lose hope, they think that they can't ever, that it won't ever get better. And that's when they lose hope. But as long as you have hope, then you're going to continue to struggle against the foibles and the wrongdoings and things that we do. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking about it's up to us to do it. What I'm talking about is enabling the Holy Spirit to empower us to do whatever God has commanded us or directed us to do. That's the, anybody over a period of time that is trying to wage war against carnality that are fighting to do better to keep the law there will be a time when they're ready to lose hope and throw in the time. What they need to know is Bible doctrine. They need to know Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. So they know that they'll never be able to keep the law. And they are striving, they're striving to do so, is taking them away from the Lord because it's not what we do that makes us acceptable to God. It's what he has already done. Following our few illustrations of the application of faith. I already went over these. <laughs> Y'all want to hear them again? Or you want, all right, we'll just move on. Then. Okay, now. This is tonight's lesson. 11, 22, 22. Now, this is Romans 8, 26. I had to do all that rest of the part because I think it will help us in our spiritual life to recall these things. It's, do you know how few numbers of Christians can know when they're going to get their resurrection body, even if they know that they're going to get a resurrection body? In the, in the time that we literally become children of God in that body. So in Romans chapter 8 verse 26 it says, And in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for word. We've heard about groanings already, haven't we? We've heard about the creation how it groans and about how people, we groan. And now we're hearing about the Holy Spirit also grow. And there's more than that that I'll show you maybe a little bit later. <clears throat> so verses 26 and 27 point out that believers are not left to their own resources in their sufferings. Remember, does anybody remember what Romans 8, 18 says? Well, it says that we cannot even start to compare the sufferings, little slight sufferings that we have here on earth compared to the weight of glory that awaits us. And so what I'm saying is, is we're not left to our own resources in suffering. We have the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus Christ as well, as I'll show you. And groaning. So we don't, we're left to, we're not left to our own resources in the sufferings, Romans 8, 18, and groanings in Romans chapter 8, verse 23. But isn't that good news? It says, and in the same way the Spirit also does what? Helps our weaknesses. Does it say you gotta try harder here? Does it say that if, you, if you're not getting better by trying to keep the law, then 
you're a miserable excuse because you can't do it. None of oh, that's nonsense. And we have the world word help here. Help. Anybody want to uh, pronounce this word for me? I got highlighted here. <laughs> It's soon anti lambanomai. Soon and you, you know, in Greek, I'll just show you this. This is what makes it how you have to break it down. You you have uh, you have soon anti lambanomai. Okay. I don't have any. This is what it looks like in the Greek. <laughs> so yeah. Well, it, this is the, some of the letters, the letters are close. See, this is a, a beta here, or it looks like a B here. And this is a tau, and then you have a T here. It, you know, it looks similar. Anyway, I just thought that was a long word. Soon, anti, uh, soon antilambanomai is a present middle indicative. And what that means is helps. What does the P mean? Present tense. It's ongoing. The Holy Spirit has ongoing help for us. And I'll pass the middle one for a moment. The I means that it's indicative. It means he actually helps. It's a reality. And the reason I skipped over the M, because that's a middle voice. And we don't have a middle voice in English. But the middle voice means that the person who... Uh, is doing the action of the verb is affected by his own action. No problem there, but on this, the Greek words that end up here, O M A I at the end, for some reason you have to choose between whether it is a middle voice or a passive voice. Passive means you receive it. Middle voice means you are affected by your own action. And the reason I was, I finally decided it's middle voice is because the Holy Spirit is the one doing it. He doesn't have to have a passive voice. He is the one doing it himself. Uh, I'm going too deep again, I guess. I'm, anyway, I thought I'd point that out. Uh, so it means to come to the aid of, be of assistance to, to help. If this term is only found one other time in the, in the Bible, and it's in Luke chapter 10, verse 40. You may have heard this before. Let me get this down here on the other line. In Luke chapter 10, verse 40, uh, 40 uh, this is when Christ came uh, <clears throat> and... Uh, Lazarus, remember the, the funeral of Lazarus, and Martha goes out there and starts raming, <coughs> excuse me. Well, let me put it this way. I'll just read it. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. Can you imagine telling Jesus Christ that? She wasn't bashful. You tell her this. And the reason I said this is because to help. See? It's, same, it's only two times that it's used that way. Anyway, that's a good, that, that's a good portion. Uh, Christ waited two or three days before he even left to come see his friend who died, Lazarus. And he was accosted when he got there. If you would have been here earlier, then he wouldn't have died. Uh, don't you know that Jesus got tired of all that crud? You do, don't you? Yeah? The maturity for sure. Well, but they were distraught because their brother had died, but still. But I, I, the whole point I, is that the word here to help is to be of assistance to. 
to be to the aid of that type. When believers pray, now this is something else that I uh, wanted to really zero in on. When believers pray in the Spirit, the Spirit Himself intercedes on their behalf. This is yet another reason why it is so important for believers to always pray in the Spirit and not in carnality. Because if you are in carnality and you are praying, then the Spirit is not going to intercede for you. He cannot. Because we have to acknowledge our sins and seek uh, or pray in humility. And if you haven't done that, you're in what? Carnality. That's another reason. If you have friends that don't know about how what we used to call rebound, or still do it, I guess, acknowledging your sins to God, 1 John 1, 9, if they don't know that, you need to get that information to them because the Holy Spirit cannot intercede on their behalf when they're in carnality. So, and in, yes. Yes. Grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit is when you commit sins and you have not acknowledged them to God. <laughs> okay, our weakness. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. What kind of weakness are we talking about? This would include our physical, psychological, which would be like emotions, and spiritual issues. It is amazing how God takes care of our every need, even when we need help to express our prayers. He didn't leave anything undone. For we do not know how to pray as we should. Prayer requires focus and concentration, and there are times when we are sleepy, exhausted, ill, are distracted, and we find it difficult to concentrate when we pray. Am I speaking for everyone here when I say that? There's been times I'd go to bed, and I'm just nearly, I fall into the bed, and I start thinking, okay, I'm going to start praying. The next thing I know, I don't even know if I start, I mean, I was going to start praying. I didn't even get to say anything. I'm gone. Sometimes we can be so confounded in our soul that we may need to take some time to calm our soul before we are ready to pray. What comes to mind is if you're really angry, you're livid, you just are boiling hot. You have to cool off so that you can pray in the Spirit before the Holy Spirit is going to be able to <coughs> excuse me to be, to be able to uh, help our weakness for him to intercede for us are these are these uh, examples ones you can identify with I don't want to answer. I mean we don't we all get to that point where we know we need to pray and that we need to maybe calm down. Maybe and when you're ill, oh, sometimes the last thing you, you 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 want to pray, you just don't have the strength to do it. You don't have the psychological makeup at that point. Sometimes, and so our God is so gracious that the Holy Spirit takes care of our weaknesses and intercedes for us. Isn't that great? Here's a I think we'll quit on this uh, prayer. I mean on this. Quote, this is from Romans Dust to Destiny. It's from Sydney. I guess it came from uh, maybe uh, Africa. Anyway, here it is. Human beings in their weakness can be confused even about what to pray. Often we are too weak and tired to formulate our thoughts into prayers. 
But someone inside may be praying nonetheless. This may only express itself to us as sighs and groans, but they may be sighs inspired in part by the Spirit of God, who is also interpreting them to God. The Spirit knows the will of God and the will and, and will pray accordingly. So these prayers will be pleasing to God and He will answer them. How important prayer must be if God even sends His Spirit to do it for us when we are too weak to do it ourselves. You know, when you just keep digging into the Bible and you find things like this, how can you not love our God even more? We are so sinful. We are so weak, pathetic. And yet, the Holy Spirit, who has a tremendous job to begin with, he's overworked, if you could say that. I know he's not overworked, but he might be with me. I don't know. But with all that is going on, God sees to every little detail. This isn't a little detail. So I'm going to throw out the anchor here, <laughs> thinking about how many ministries the Holy Spirit has. If you sat down and was going to do, do a treatise on the Holy Spirit and his ministries and you went in depth in each one, you probably have about a 600-page book just on that. But tonight I will go to sleep, and before I sleep, I pray. And I can tell you one thing I'm going to be doing. This is Thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving. I'm going to be thanking Him for what the Holy Spirit does in helping my weakness. Every time you learn something else about God, it's always more gratitude that should be given because we have such a phenomenal and great God. Okay, let's pray. Oh, oh, before we close, I, I, I forgot to tell you something. Yeah. There'll be no Bible class Thursday, and there'll be no uh, fun Friday this Friday. So, uh, I, want, I, I was going to say it at the beginning, but at least I got it in. Kind of spoiled the mood, but uh, there it is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can come to you at any time and have access to you, and you hear our prayer. We don't have to be eloquent. Sometimes we don't even know what to say. Sometimes we can't even figure out what the issue is uh, well enough to where, in our mind, you can understand it. Well, you are, you are omniscient. There's nothing that you don't know or can't understand. But even when we are in those situations, the Holy Spirit can take up the soul. And he utters groans. Creation groans, we groan, the Holy Spirit groans, and even Jesus Christ intercedes for us as well. We pray that we will have a true gratitude on Thanksgiving Day and every other day as well. We are so blessed and the more that we read your word and learn Bible doctrine, the more awesome you are and the more we can trust you and see your faithfulness. We pray that this Thanksgiving, that people will see it in us. And every time that we have a chance to impart our great gratitude for all the things you've done for us, that we'll do it, that we'll do it in a way that we're not infringing upon someone who doesn't want to hear it to begin with. We just are so thankful. How can we not be thankful for learning what we have in Romans 8 and now that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us when we're too weak? We thank you for that. Pray that we could show our gratitude by being good and faithful servants. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Yes. That's right. <clears throat> Some people, you know, I, I, when I was growing up, there's a lot of people would say the Holy Ghost.